Hi, good afternoon. As Ryan uh, mentioned, my name is Craig Wittgenstein, and I'm here to talk a little bit about, Kevin called it supply, Ryan called it uh, manufacturing, but it's tech ops is the, the term that I use. And so as Ryan mentioned, I have, a, I think, a little bit of a unique perspective about this. So I've spent the last 15 years working in tech ops, uh, the majority of which was outside of the, the antibiotic space. And so I have the last year and a half of a really thrilling uh, and exciting experience at Occasion to talk about, which included uh, helping Ryan and the team bring the drug to approval, to launch, and then the aftermath, which I imagine some of you guys are, are somewhat familiar with. So I'm hopefully going to kind of round out the picture and tell you a little bit about the tech ops story within the antibiotic space. So uh, standard disclosures on here in, in, in terms of uh, what I'm going to talk about. So I'm assuming that uh, several of you in the room may be a little bit less familiar with the tech ops side of things. So I figured I'd spend just a couple minutes giving you a bit of context about what is tech ops, what do we do, and you know some of the components of it. So I put together this slide that kind of speaks to maybe six of the bigger buckets that what tech ops touches about. So the first one there, admittedly, is kind of the pre-approval side. And I know we're talking a lot about what life is like post-approval, but I think it's important to understand all the work that goes into getting to approval and, and some of those commitments that carry on well beyond approval, similar to what Kevin talked about in his side of the story. So, you know, tech ops is really a key component and a key partner in getting a drug approved and all the work that goes into getting it through development. So early on within the research days, you know, tech ops plays a critical role in, in you know, producing a product and, and ensuring that it's safe to kind of start even in the preclinical trials. And then throughout the development cycle in partnership with the, the timelines in the clinical side, on the technical side, there's a lot of work that goes into ensuring the drug is robust, scalable, and efficient to, or appropriate to be used commercially. And so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that, but just uh, you know, understand that there's a lot of work that goes in there. And then beyond that, you know, ultimately what tech ops is accountable for is really about material supply. You know, Ryan touched on that when he talked about orphan drugs and, and Kevin as well, but ensuring that we have material on the market. And that sounds quite simple, and I, you know, if there's one thing I want you to walk away from is remember there's no magic spigot that we kind of pull and, and pull drug out of and just kind of have unlimited supply. There's a tremendous amount of work that goes into that and, uh, and you know, just appreciate that there's a lot of components and costs that are associated with that. You know, when we have a drug on the market, you know, it's our job within Tech Ops and the, and the company as a sponsor to make sure that drug is safe, pure, and effective. And, you know, there's a lot of upfront work that goes into the application that enables that to be the case. But then on an ongoing basement basis, similar to the, the pharma vigilance and other components, you know, there's a number of commitments that we need to make and follow through on to ensure that that continues to be the case. And then ultimately, it's our mission, you know, that Tech Ops and the costs associated with it are not an impediment to patients having access to our drugs. So absolutely keeping supply costs is, is a critical component that we think about. And then within that, you know, we talked a little bit about the, the, the regulatory component, but there are a number of uh, regulatory guidelines, and many of you might be familiar with a concept called GMP, but there's a little C that's in front of that GMP, and that C stands for you know, the, the current part of GMP manufacturing. So those regulations are consistently changing, and we are obligated to stay up with those, and there's a lot of work and, and commitments that go along with that. So now that you have a bit of the context, let me maybe leave you with three key bullets that you know, come into the story around tech ops and the costs that are associated with it. So the first is the infrastructure piece. Kevin talked a lot about the infrastructure on the medical affair size and other aspects of the business, but recognize that there's a similar amount and then sometimes more of infrastructure that's required to just not just enable the approval and launch, but really maintain that quality supply of the drug. And so that includes the supply piece, the manufacturing, and a lot of work and, and dollars that goes into quality and compliance to make sure that the drug that we're producing continues, again, to be safe, pure, and effective. The other, the second key component is cycle times. You guys might be familiar or have heard of that term, but the cycle times are long. The lead times are long. We're not talking about days, not weeks. In some cases, not even months. It often can be quoted in years that it takes to kind of do the multiple steps that are required in tech ops. And that can include components like selecting your partners, assuming you're going to outsource something. You're making those decisions on who you're going to outsource with years in advance of when you're going to actually work and commercialize product with those partners. And in, in the case that you try to internalize it and produce those 
products yourselves, building those plants, again, those can take years to build and you're making those decisions well in advance and carrying those costs forward beyond that. And then ultimately the decision to make material and build inventory, given that these are long lead times, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some examples of that, you're making those decisions to make material today for material that you're not gonna use for a couple years out in some cases. And so you can imagine, again, the cost equation is you're spending dollars today that you won't get to recoup into years in advance. And then similarly, in a world of continued expected growth and success, you have to decide when is it the appropriate time when I might need to scale up and produce more of my material or come to a bigger plant. Because in oftentimes when you start with a partner or a production facility, you'll start on a smaller scale for costs and other considerations. But at some point you need to scale up to make it more economically viable. And you're gonna have to make those decisions well in advance of when they're needed. And you can, again, imagine there's a lot of costs associated with that. And there could also be considerations of when you need multiple suppliers. If you're thinking about it from a diversification or a risk mitigation standpoint, when do I look for that additional supplier? When do I find more sources? And then lastly, and this is all wrapped together, is in my experience and, and across the different therapeutic areas that I've worked in, within antibiotics, I would make the opinion that the, the network of suppliers is quite limited and the folks that are in this space, a lot of their facilities are of the, the older variety, to say it lightly. Uh, and you, know, you can imagine there's some components of costs that come along with that, but also in terms of quality and, and some of the repercussions and you know, having worked in, in the, the work that we did at, at Occasion, you know, we came across some of those aspects of it and, and frankly, some of you might have seen it in, in some of the health authority responses and some of the CRLs and complete response letters that have been received by folks trying to get their drugs approved based on the manufacturing component. So trying to summarize this at a very high level, when I came into the tech ops organization, we tried to kind of think about the lens of what is the footprint of a tech ops organization and what might it look like. And again, not getting into a lot of detail, I can happily provide some of that information to you guys uh, offline. But you know, if you look at the three lenses that you might think about is how much capacity do I need to make my drug? How much inventory should I build? What type of inventory considerations? And then as a license holder or as the the owner of that drug, what type of oversight should I apply? And so having come from a therapeutic area where the equation was a little bit different, I, I will tell you, we lived on that world of no risk of stockouts. There was no question. There was no ability to have any interrupted supply. So it was not even a decision of where we were going to live. When, we came, when I came to a cage and there was a lot of thought that went into it, and you know, ideally we wanted to spend the appropriate amount of money, right? We don't want to overbuild, as, as Ryan mentioned, but we also can't underbuild and, and just kind of use hope as a strategy. And so we have to really be thoughtful about that. And so we, we tried to end up closer to this sweet spot space. And, and again, the cost numbers here are, are highly generalized, but are, are based on some accurate data and firsthand experience. But no matter which place you end up in, it is a significant amount of dollars. But even within that, you know, there is some variety, but you have to really be thoughtful about the implications of, of doing that and the cost associated with it. So this is just to, again, to give you a high level perspective of some of the considerations. So to kind of expand on, on the second point in terms of lead time. So just to give you an example of what a supply chain might look like for a, a new antibiotic. And so on the, on the left side there is your source for raw material. So a lot of our drugs start with a, a, some key starting materials. And so those, depending on the timelines and how proprietary they are, they could take as long as six to eight months to procure those materials. And so, and, and in many cases, you have multiple suppliers and you can imagine there's a lot of work that goes into negotiating those contracts and maintaining those contracts. And in some cases, and that's why there's multiple flags, you might decide that, you know, it's not good enough to have one supplier and, and run that risk there. I might need multiple suppliers and, and it could depend on who that supplier is, their reputation, their reliability, their geography, and, and that's an, an example on the left side. And then if you go into the kind of the crunch time of the, the key component of it is the making aspect of it. Typically, it's broken into three big buckets. So you've got what we call the drug substance or the API, and then you have on the bottom there the drug product, and then ultimately the pack and label or the finished goods, and all in all that can take an order of a, a year easily to, depending on your process and the specifics of it. So. Again, in this case, you might choose that you want a single source component, and that would be, as this example, one flag, or you might want to dual source it. And 
you know, nothing comes for free. So if you choose to dual source, there's a lot more, you in some ways double the cost and a lot of that work will happen up front. And you, again, you'll be having the burden of those dollars well in advance of when you're gonna recoup the cost of that. And then ultimately you'll have the deliver and return piece of it and, and not to take lightly the return because there, again, there's a lot of oversight that goes around that. So just to kind of drive this home and make it very simple and, and, and illustrative, is I kind of created a, a graph here to show you an example of, hypothetically speaking, a, a drug that's growing at a, a reasonable rate, and, and again, don't put too much credibility into the actual units, but let's just assume that a drug on that line is growing at that rate of sales. As I told you, if, you know, assuming your lead time is in the order of two years, I'm making the inventory in purple there in year one that I can build and start to build so that I have inventory and can sell it in year two or three, and again, I'm spending those dollars today, and while it might cost me less than I'm ultimately gonna recoup from a, a sales price, uh, you know, I'm spending it at a time when I don't have those dollars to recuperate from. And then lastly, just to kind of drive home, again, a specific example, I, I, I kind of speculated or, or made a, a statement about the, the limited universe. So this is a real world example that, that we were living through in a, at a cage in, is when we were looking at a, a potential combination of VLBLI and you know, going around and looking at who our options were specifically to make Ceph is, you know, frankly, we, we couldn't really find that many after canvassing the entire world for them. And the folks that we did find were probably in you know, not the most contemporary locations in, in, in the world. And, and you know, there's a number of implications that come along with that. And then that was just on the API side. And then when we looked to, to combine those drugs into a single drug product, you know, the universe really came to pretty much one to zero of, of folks that were willing to, to work with us. So, uh, and then that one uh, supplier that was willing to work with us, we had to actually invest a, a bit of money for them to actually make it compliant from their standpoint. And this has to do with cleaning considerations and other compliance aspects. Uh, and then, so again, this is just one example of, of the story and, and you know, as I acknowledge that you know, I've only been in this space for a year and a half, but it, it was definitely a one that provided a lot of perspective and insights that kind of complements the story that Ryan, uh, Kevin uh, have explained so far. So with that in mind, I will hand it over to kind of round out the story and look at the price side of uh, the equation. Thanks, Ralph. <laughs> 